With Roe v. Wade on the brink of being overruled, you know that abortion is the issue of the day. And on this show, we do not want to just be pyromaniacs in a field of straw men. We want to take on the abortion arguments in as strong a form as they possibly can by people who sincerely make them. Uh, we invite lots of people from the left, from the pro-abortion movement on. Usually they tell us to go pound sand if they respond at all, but sometimes there are people who do have the courage of their convictions to come out and defend their views. One of those people is Victoria Hammett. Victoria is the deputy executive director of Gen Z for Change, and uh, Victoria also is a huge TikTok star. I have recently been kicked off of TikTok. I have absolutely nowhere to post either my ticks or my talks, but Victoria is still on there. She has almost 800,000 followers. She uses that platform, uh, among other things, to advocate for abortion. And so I figured uh, it would be good to have Victoria onto the show to discuss the issue in a, in a calm, productive, and, and hopefully illuminating way. Victoria, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Well, I, I appreciate your, your coming on the show. We've talked about this issue with some other people from the, who, who support abortion. And we've talked about it from the legal perspective. We've talked about it from the medical perspective. A lot of your videos uh, are, are more philosophical, I guess. They just come down to not so much this idea that abortion should be legally safe, safe, legal, and rare, or that abortion is this kind of a medical procedure. But really, you're saying, look, abortion is a good thing. Uh, and we should have it in order to maximize women's bodily autonomy or whatever the arguments are. So I, I don't want to put any words into your mouth, if, if you wouldn't mind. What's the case for it? Right. So um, obviously, I'm a firm believer that everyone should have the right to bodily autonomy. I would also like to see abortions be, um, you know, rare, legal and safe as well. Um, and I think that there are a few ways we can go about doing that. I don't think that banning abortion is one of them. Can I ask you first, um, though, then, because I, I'm, I'm surprised actually to hear you say the safe, legal and rare line. Why, why do you think they should be rare? Um, well, unfortunately, we live in a country where a lot of people might want to continue a pregnancy, but feel like they're unable to because of financial struggles um, and other factors like that. And so, well, in my but, but eyes, before we continue there, it, it is worth pointing out there are an estimated 36 couples for every newborn baby put up for adoption in the United States, 36 couples who want to adopt that baby. So I, I could understand one right. saying that there, there would be a, too much of a financial struggle to raise the baby. But in terms of just not killing the baby in the womb, surely that, that would not be a financial burden. Unfortunately, there are a lot of medical costs associated with pregnancy, not to mention that less than 23% of people are actually offered maternal leave. So this means but, that but some you wouldn't, people you wouldn't, to, you wouldn't need maternal well, leave if you're giving the baby up for abortion, well, or for, for adoption, well, rather. So in my personal opinion, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm explaining my own philosophy well. I think that if you want to have a baby, you should be able to have one regardless of your financial situation. Yeah, and so I don't I think that you should be forced to abort or put it up for adoption. I think that we should live in a country where having a child isn't a privilege. But if we want to look into totally. why I actually believe that abortion should be legal, my primary concern is with the bodily autonomy argument, especially when you consider the amount of long-term risks associated with pregnancy. I, I do want to get to the bodily autonomy argument, I, but I... I I would like to clarify first, you're saying that abortion should be rare because sometimes people want to be able to have their babies and uh, they might feel forced to abort the baby. Is that the only reason why you think it should be rare because of the desires of the mother to keep the baby and having nothing to do with the, the humanity of the baby himself? Well, also, abortion can be um, traumatizing and emotionally damaging for the people who are pregnant who choose to have an abortion. And so Why? for those reasons, again, um, well, there are various reasons. I mean, number one, pro-lifers aren't that kind to uh, people who choose to have abortions. I think we're I'd very imagine. kind, but but even... Well, even I'd, I'd, imagine, I'd imagine it could be difficult if you're raised in a pro-life family and decided to have an abortion. There are a lot of factors that contribute to this um, emotional distress. But at the end of the day, again, I don't have a problem with abortion. I think it should be legal. Do you think that the emotional distress that comes with having an abortion, which I totally agree exists, and I, mm -hmm. I know friends of mine I know who have had abortions, I know that they have, have dealt with that. Do you think that is only because of the social stigma surrounding abortion? Or do you think there's something about abortion itself that causes that kind of stress and trauma? Well, because of the social stigma associated with abortion, it would be impossible to determine that any uh, trauma or emotional distress as the result of abortion came from the abortion alone. The social stigma would be a huge confounding variable in that. Well, so I guess I guess what my example for this... I have no idea. 
My well, example. Moral of the story. Moral of the story. I do want to get back on track. Moral of the story is I, that um, I have no problem with abortion, but when I see statistics that say that a majority of abortions happen because of financial issues, what that says to me is, oh, these people aren't just saying I don't want to have a baby. People are saying I can't have a baby. So for those reasons, I would like to focus on systemic issues that lead to abortions as opposed to just banning abortions entirely. Now, on this point, you say that it would be impossible to uh, distinguish between the stress and trauma that comes from the social stigma surrounding abortion versus the act of abortion itself. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that's quite the case. If I lost my arm in an accident, let's say I were in some mechanical accident, I lost my arm. There is some stigma around being uh, mutilated or, or uh, disabled in this country. There's no, no doubt there is a social stigma around that. But I would also be upset and traumatized because of the fact of losing my arm, right? It would, I would just know that that was an injury that I have suffered beyond what my community is telling me about it. I, that, would, that would cause me some stress and trauma just in do and you, of itself. Do you view fetuses, do you view fetuses as an extension of a person's body? No, I view, it, I view it as your... No, no, no. No, I view the baby as your child. And I'm saying, like, I would recognize that there is an... Why are you doing it? Well, because I'm, I'm showing that there is a, a distinction between feeling stress and trauma from something that is in, intrinsically traumatic versus feeling, ver, versus feeling stress and trauma because of the uh, attitudes of your social community. Right. So and I'm saying that there's... Similar to postpartum depression, which is something that people experience when they have to carry a baby out, even if they want the baby, especially if it's an unwanted pregnancy, postpartum depression, that's also a huge issue as well. Sure. But but so I, 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 that seems to me slightly beside the point. Not directly related to pregnancy, not you know. Sure, but I guess I guess what I'm saying is it would seem to me that what, the reason that women feel trauma and stress from abortion, perhaps it has something to do with the social stigma as well. But there is also something intrinsic about the act of abortion, knowing that you, a mother, have killed your own child. That is the so gnawing part of your conscience you that gives that you that stress. Would you argue that there's something intrinsically amoral about um, carrying a pregnancy, determine giving birth to it, and that's why people experience postpartum depression post-pregnancy? No, I think po I mean, postpartum depression is certainly a medical right. condition. Exactly. And, and by the, by the way, there, 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 there's 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 following an abortion. But there, there's so long as it's not confounded by social factors. No, there, well. there's there's a natural basis for postpartum depression as well, though. You've just been carrying this little baby in your womb so close to you. And now that baby is outside of you. And obviously you're still caring for it. One hopes. But uh, but, you know, there, there's a kind of natural feeling of loss. One can understand postpartum depression, not merely as an irrational fact of your chemicals, but as a natural reaction to the separation of you from your baby. One can understand that sort of thing. And so one can understand the natural... Well, uh, just Sorry. to finish this point, one can understand the natural stress one would feel and trauma and, and sadness at having killed one's baby. And even if one can rationalize this fact and say, no, I didn't really kill my baby, or no, it's just a clump of cells, or no, it's not really human, or no, it's, I had every right to kill the baby. Still, you know, because we're moral creatures and we have a conscience, we know that, and I suspect that would gnaw at somebody. Michael, um, what are you basing this off of? Do you have any studies that prove that people feel this overwhelming guilt following an abortion, or have you had an abortion? No, you're, you're the one who claimed out? it. You said that one of the reasons you want abortion to be rare is because oh, people yeah. feel stress I, and trauma. I was, just acknowledging, I was acknowledging that some people report emotional distress. As for the factors that contribute to that emotional distress, I think definitively saying that it is guilt would be quite the claim to make that you would need some uh, evidence backing. Well, but no, I, I, my, my, my evidence, I suppose, is the natural law that mothers have an obligation to their children and, and we feel sad when our children die. And, when we, and we feel sad when we commit sins. We feel sad what, when we what, do things that are what, wrong. Right? Just to be clear, that would, that would not be your proposed explanation for postpartum depression? No, I mean, postpartum depression, Again, I mean, I, I think I just, I just explained the... If you feel guilty, then, you know, you're somehow no, the, making the claim... The, there, there is a, a natural sadness after one gives birth, which we now call postpartum depression, and there are perfectly reasonable explanations for that, and there are chemical there are reasons no for that, and they, changes, right, of course. Which also happen after an abortion. Right. Anyways, moving and, and, on. And one also, one also feels sad when one... Or, or feels trauma, or one feels regret when one commits any bad action, right? If I go and steal a candy bar from the newsstand, I will feel bad about that. Do I have a study proving why I feel bad? No, I have a conscience. That's why I feel bad. Well, no one's saying that they feel bad. People are saying that they experience some form of emotional distress. And I can spe speak that, anecdotally. That's feeling bad. Um, the people who I know who have had abortions had no problem with their abortions morally. It was more so the reaction from family and friends that really upset them and caused them a lot of emotional distress. Perhaps Apparently, the ladies don't protest too much. I'm not sure. 
I'm well, sure. regardless, Michael, can I ask you, are you against abortions in all cases? And then additionally, do you just support the overturning of Roe versus Wade or would you support a national abortion ban? I would certainly support a national abortion ban. I think the stronger way to overrule Roe v. Wade would be to observe that from the 14th Amendment, uh, people have a right to equal protection. And so abortion should be legal throughout the country. And yes, I, I oppose legal abortion. And what, why do you oppose any and all legal abortions, even in cases of rape, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I oppose abortion in all cases. I mean, I, f- I feel very sad for victims of rape, but uh, I don't think that... Do you I don't, think that they should continue their pregnancy? Well, I, I think that... Uh, I, I don't think that the answer to rape is killing a baby. I don't think that's that's good. And I, it, point, it, it seems quite clear to me that, uh, it, you know, the, the baby already exists. So while one might attempt to procure an abortion in order to undo some some genuinely grievous wrong that was done to somebody, you can't really undo it because the baby is there. And so, for instance, the, you're going to give birth to the baby one way or the other. You'll either give birth to a dead baby that has been dismembered through abortion, or you'll give birth to a living baby, and you can put the baby up for adoption, or you can choose to raise it. But there's there, there's no... You, I, I, wish, I wish there medical, were any... Are you, are you aware of the actual medical procedure that accounts for over 90% of abortions? Because it's not dismemberment. I am. Well, uh, dis- dismemberment... No medical abortion. Di- yeah, dis- dismemberment is, uh, is a, a very common form of abortion. And it, it, I mean, we've very common, no. O- over 90% just involved dispelling the embryo from uh, the uterine but, lining. Victoria, there, there have been six, 62 million babies killed through abortion since Roe versus Wade. So even even 90%, we're talking about 6 million babies killed through through. Well, regardless, I just wanted to, I mean, you were saying that those were the only two ways that a baby can come out. I was just clearing up because I feel like that, you know, it, it would Well, no, but I, what unfair. I'm saying, the, the baby is going to come out. The baby's not, the, the baby will right. come out either alive or dead. And so sometimes right. you'll hear pro-abortion people use a very silly line. They'll say, do you support forced birth? And I say, well, I'm, I, I don't support forced birth. One will give birth either way, either to a dead baby or a living baby. I just oppose killing the baby in the womb. You just support uh, pro, you're, you're pro forced pregnancy, even for people who are victims of rape. And I, I guess my, my question- No, you, my th- question, they are already pregnant. I'm not f- pro forced pregnancy. I'm against killing the baby to pretend that one is not already right, pregnant you're, you're when one is. Them, you're against them terminating the pregnancy before it's out term, even in cases of rape. I'm not trying to misrepresent your argument. I'm trying to move on to the next point. Um, I, I guess my, my kind of curiosity and confusion when it comes to conservative pro-lifers is y'all's sense of liberty and freedom and bodily autonomy as it pertains to everything except for abortion, which Wait. I find quite interesting. I, 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 I think mean, you might be mistaken. Of- I'm not I'm not sure where I've expressed a view that is in favor of bodily autonomy in all well, cases except for abortion. Would you, and if I'm misrepresenting you, I apologize, but would you support, um, in the name of preserving life and the name of keeping other people safe, would you support uh, legislation that would criminalize uh, people who chose to not get the COVID vaccine or put them in jail for, I think it's upward of 10 years. Would you support legislation like that? No, no. I think the mandatory COVID vac- safe and effective COVID vaccines that don't actually stop you from contracting or spreading the virus. And I think a legislation about the masks, for instance. I'm sorry? They reduce transmission rates. Right. But we were told by Dr. We were told by Dr. Fauci and Rochelle Walensky and Joe Biden that they would stop you from contracting the virus and spreading the virus. And that's what vaccines are supposed to we, All of them. We have it on tape. Uh, that's what vaccines are supposed to do. And then they move the goalposts because the vaccines didn't actually accomplish that. So sure, maybe they maybe was, they reduce hospitalizations or death. Maybe they don't. I don't really care either way. Do. Uh, what, what I'm saying is, but regard, let's say that they do. Regardless, my opposition to those mandates does not come from any p- place of uh, my sacred individual right not to wear a mask. It just comes from the prudence and uh, the imprudence and the disorder of mandating those masks and drugs that did not prove nearly as effective as we were told they would. They reduce tra- transmission rates significantly. Sh- even, sure, um, like, with the, what, sure um, yes or no, but that's sort of, s- that's well, secondary if, to the argument. Even, even if it would save lives, you know, even if it would save lives, you don't believe in a, uh, I don't federal think, I don't think, I don't vaccine. think that really will save lives, but my, my argument, if it did, if my, it did save mm, lives objectively, if it did. Well, it, d- it depends. I, w- I would have to exercise my prudence in that case. I, I would have to see the numbers. I would have to see how onerous the uh, change in behaviors would be. I would not have any firm argument that I, as an individual, have some sacred natural right not to wear a mask. That's not the place that I'm coming from. I'm coming from, uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, people have a right to do things that are not reasonable or not to their benefit. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I appreciate that perspective, definitely. And I would say that this kind of um, factors into the same kind of idea of the government being able to 
force you to do something with your own body in order to keep other people safe, which it's interesting. We didn't even consider putting people in jail for not getting the vaccine. But now with abortions, we are starting to consider uh, criminalization uh, at the state level. It depends on the state, obviously. No, nobody, nobody is suggesting throwing women in jail for getting abortions. People are suggesting abortion criminalizing abortion. Yeah. And, I'm sorry? Abortion providers. Uh, abortion yeah, we, providers. we should. I think every last abortionist in this country should be at least in prison, certainly. Kind of a weird take, but uh, I'm well, gonna, how is that a I'm weird take? They're they're um, they're killing they're killing innocent little babies. Obviously, that should be against the law, and they should be tried I, for that and go to prison. I least. think that we should look at murder and um, having control and say over one's body as very different things, especially when we, when we consider not in this case. <laughs> especially when we consider the long-term risks associated with pregnancy. We're looking at a lifetime risk of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, permanent changes to the pelvic floor, um, like pel pelvic organ prolapse, postpartum back pain that might last up for up to uh, 10 years following a pregnancy, postpartum depression, not to mention the cost of actually just giving birth in a hospital setting or having a C-section alone. All of those different factors, I think that it is an overreach of government power to be able to force someone to endure all of those things, especially in cases where they have been raped. I mean, do you think that that's fair, that someone against their own will entirely can be impregnated and then forced to risk developing all of these long-term complications mm -hmm. and forced to pay for um, the actual, uh, you know... Victoria, uh, what, what, what percentage of abortions uh, occur in the case of rape? Um, oh, that doesn't matter to me. I think one 13-year-old who is raped less, and forced to carry but, that pregnancy, I think that that's Victoria, a tragedy. But, but I, I know, I, it, it is very tragic. But you, but you keep going back to this point to make some broader right. argument at once philosophical, but then uh, then legal uh, for abortion. But uh, So I think it would be clarifying to, to ask what percentage of abortions actually occur in the event of the thing that you are almost exclusively talking about. Oh, I'm not exclusively talking about rape at all, but I'll tell you, it's a low percentage, but that doesn't what, matter. What is the percent? I'll tell you, if you don't have the number, it's less than 1% of all abortions. Yeah, and that doesn't So 99% plus are elective abortions of people who have had consensual sex and consented to come together with someone that they love or just winked at them across the bar with the obvious uh, natural consequence of that, of conceiving a baby, and then they change their mind, and in order to uh, express their regret, they kill a child. Do, does anyone think that that is moral or just? Um, I again wouldn't consider it. Can I wouldn't consider it killing a child? Let me let me give you an, you an analogy to kind of help demonstrate this point better. Let's say you're driving and you're driving safely. You're not drunk. You're not driving recklessly. Um, and a stoplight is out. You know, some form of protection fails. Yeah, it doesn't keep you safe. You accidentally hit someone, and that person is now in critical condition. And let's say that there is some sort of procedure where you could hook yourself up to this person for nine months to sustain their life. Should the government be able to legally force you to hook yourself up to this person, give them your bodily resources for nine months, have you be at risk for lifetime long complications as a result of this procedure? Should the government be able to legally force you to do that? And if you would decide not to do that, would that be considered murder? So, so what you've just described is a version of what's called the violinist argument, right? And the violinist mm -hmm. argument is probably the most popular argument for abortion. Okay. I think it's the, the most widely printed philosophical essay of all time. And it's a version of this, which is one day you wake up, you go to sleep, you wake up, and you're attached via a tube to the greatest violinist in the world. And the, the Musical Society of America has kidnapped you. They said, I'm very sorry we had to kidnap you, but uh, your kidneys are the, are the best kidneys to keep this violinist alive. So you can unplug yourself, but if you unplug yourself, the violinist will die. And if you keep yourself plugged in for nine months, then the violinist will live. That's, a, that's basically the argument you're making, right? No, I was making the argument that I said about the driving and the stoplight. Oh, okay, but we're, we're changing the details here. But the, the substance of that argument would remain essentially the same. I, I, I imagine you're familiar with the violinist argument, are you not? I, I am. And so how, 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 would, how would your version differ from the violinist argument? My version differs because um, in you know the driving analogy, you are choosing to drive, you understand the risks of driving, you understand that you could get into a car accident, right? And so this is where it becomes more comparative to consensual sex. But, but then... And so, Sure. But so, okay, I, I see that distinction. So but that would understand. seem to weaken the argument for abortion, would it not? Because no, you're, you're I, all I consenting so, to the rules think, of the road. I think even in a situation where you understand that driving could uh, realistically lead to a car crash, you could injure someone every time you get into a car. I think that even understanding those risks, 
you should not be forced to hook yourself but, up to but, in but, this analogy. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Do okay, you think the uh, government should be able to legally force you to do that? Well, Victoria, I guess uh, when I get into a car, I understand the risk that I could be hit by a, a reckless driver. And I do not think that there is any obligation of that driver to plug himself into me and try to keep me alive, right? That's the, that, that's the uh, legal regime that we've established for you? driving. Would he be murdering you if, um, would, would he be murdering you? No, if we, we, we would, right. no, no cer- certainly he would not be uh, murdering me. We would not, uh, we, we would not live in a society that would pass such laws because right. we, we do not, right, because uh, we recognize that when we get into a car, we do not have uh, the, the same obligations that we would have for random other drivers on the road, all of whom have consented to get onto that road, that we would have, for instance, to our baby, right? The baby is not deciding to get into a car. The baby okay. is, is being created through the sexual act that you and your sexual partner have chosen to engage in. And so the analogy say, doesn't seem it's the precise. same analogy, but you hit a baby this time who obviously can't consent to being in a moving vehicle. Should the government be able to legally require that you are hooked up to that baby for nine months to sustain its life? The, the, the baby's driving the car? No, the baby's in the back seat of a car. The baby's anyway. in the back seat of a car, and you've hit the, the car, and now, and we've passed a law that says that uh, people who hit no, cars... No, we haven't with- passed any laws. I'm, I'm trying to remove the bodily autonomy argument from abortion, and I know, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm trying to just... Yeah, I'm, I'm having a little trouble it. following this one. I have a little easier trouble with the... Or a li- little easier time with the violinist argument. This one, this one keeps changing. So there's no... Okay. Uh, it, would, so would, it, would, it be, would it be too much to ask? I, I know that parables are very helpful and, uh, you know, our Lord speaks in parables too. But yeah. what, it, what is the philosophical point you are making with this, with this analogy? So my point is that I believe that everyone should have autonomy over their own body. People should be able to make choices as it pertains to their bodies, especially um, when okay. choices. Okay, now I get it. Like now I get it. Now, do you, so okay. would you say that um, a, a baby who's just been born, is that mm-hmm. baby... Uh, autonomous? A baby that's just been born? Yeah. Uh, was it born like it's viable? At, yeah. Yeah, it's just born. He's born. Okay, so, but not really. If you, if uh, the mother does not feed that baby, that baby is going to die. If you put that baby in a field, that baby is not going to live for very long. What, what you're conflating here is expenditure of energy versus bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy would require your bodily resources. Again, like I keep saying, yeah, like, pregnancy. Like milk out of a woman's, out of a mother's breast, right? Um, you are not legally obligated to breastfeed your child. You can give your child formula. Sure, but, but you are but you are obligated to to feed your child. Right, which is care an expenditure of energy. Infringing okay. on people's but, but, right so, to never so expend expen- energy could, isn't could, something that should be protected. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to legally require people to go to the mailbox to send in their taxes, right? It right, but, but then... Sort of expenditure but the, of energy I, I, I think it seems to me you're making a distinction without a difference. If one is saying that one can require me to expend my energy, then one is saying that they can require me to do certain things with my body at certain times, for that matter. No, and so uh, what's the distinction? Can I ask... Um, well, what is the, uh, uh, what are the long-term health complications of feeding your child or surrendering your child, giving your child up for abortion, which well, is you, also something you, you, you might have to make some sacrifices to feed your child. You might not be able to eat the kind of meals that you want right. to eat every night. But you we, can, you can give your child up for adoption, correct? Yes. And, and surrender those responsibilities. Exactly. Exactly. Well, if, if, if uh, you, you can give your child up for adoption because there are so many couples who want to adopt babies, but you don't, you I'm don't have a right to have your, your child adopted though. That's the other thing. You, you do have oh. a natural responsibility to your child, which I guess is what I keep talking about because the way that you're talking about these babies, and I, I think this is why I struggled a little bit with your analogy of driving and the stoplight is you're, you're describing this as though uh, the the roles here are just totally impersonal and replaceable and interchangeable. But I'm not just talking about a random person here. I'm talking about a, a, a baby, a child, a mother's own child. And, and I guess what I'm asking, while you're approaching this issue from the position of rights, I'm approaching it from the position of natural obligation. Does a mother not have certain natural obligations to her own child? And is not the most basic obligation that a mother might have to her own child not to kill that child? Well, so if you believe in these natural obligations that mothers have to their children, would you support legislation that would criminalize the act of putting your child up for adoption? Would you support mothers who? No, choose to I, put think their that, I think I think putting a child up for adoption can be a, a great example of, of right. caring so a great you, deal for you, your child. 
Okay. Okay. So, well, because that's, that's where I'm getting a bit confused. Unfortunately, right. if, if a mother is not fit to raise her, if a mother is not fit or able to raise her child, then it would be an act of great love and, and care and, and even sacrifice to put that child up for adoption. So I don't see why one even, would Even if the that. child is put up for adoption later and might have to struggle in the foster care system. Well, uh, I mean, you're just saying that people have a natural obligation well, to their children. And so I'm wondering if you would want to criminalize any act that would put your child well, in Well, I, I, I would want to criminalize the acts that require Child Protective Services to go in and take babies out of their homes, but those are already against the law. We already have laws against all right. those things. So when you talk about putting a child up for adoption later, that's what we're talking about, but that's already against the law, right? Neglect, right. drug abuse, that sort of stuff. That, that's already right, because, illegal. Because we so do certainly I'll support that. And, and we have that adoption um, option in terms of when you are raising a child, but unfortunately, when you are pregnant, there is no incubator currently where you can just, you know, okay. take it out. So, so then, incubator. so you're saying that if if we got to the point where uh, a, a baby were, let's say, viable at 21 weeks, which now some babies can survive even being born at 21 weeks, and they might need a little time in that incubator, they might need to cook for a little bit, but you could get the baby out of there, then, okay, would you support criminalizing abortion at 21 weeks or whatever that point is, the point at which the baby could then uh, gestate in, artificially in an incubator, you would support saying no more abortions after this point? Um, well, I would, have a few, I would have a few questions. So this procedure, would it be free? Sure. Yeah, then sure. Really? You would, so then let's say uh, uh, maybe, a gal, maybe. hold on, well, well, let's say a gal goes in, she's 26 weeks pregnant. She could have put this baby into the incubator at uh, 21 weeks, but she says, no, I, I want to have an abortion. I think that is, this is a good use of my bodily autonomy. I don't think that the baby is a morally valuable being, and so I want to have the abortion. And you might plead with the woman. You might say, no, abortion just, just put the baby in the I'm sorry? Yeah, put the baby in the no, incubator. No, but, but she's, she's made up her mind. She says, no, it is my exercise of my bodily autonomy. I have a right to an abortion, and I want to have this abortion. You, you would say, no, lady, you don't get to I have think it. you're misunderstanding bodily autonomy. Um, in, in the instance where the fetus or whatever it would be at that point, I believe fetus would be Maybe. taken out and put in an, uh, put in an incubator at that point. Um, she, she would be essentially denying her bodily resources to that child. She would still have bodily autonomy in that situation. If she chose to put it in an incubator as a term and uh, as opposed to just aborting, but she it. wouldn't, now, she wouldn't have there would be, sorry. She, I just wanted to clarify. Obviously we're not speaking about, you know, uh, cases where the person's life would be at risk, who's pregnant, and sure. cases other than that where this is more of an elective. Well, I'm glad um, to hear you say this, though. So you're saying that at the point at which the baby could could come out and and continue to gestate on its own, you would be totally fine. So you're, you're not saying that women have some real essential right to an abortion. You're just saying that... Uh, we, we would like to protect abortion legally up until a certain point, but after a certain point, they don't have that right to an abortion. I think, I think especially when we consider um, how difficult pregnancy and also just uh, parenthood is in the United States, I think at any point from the beginning of pregnancy until the child is 18, a parent should be able to uh, refuse to be a parent to that child, if that makes sense. And unfortunately, when we're looking at cases of abortion, um, you know, again, there is no real like ad adoption equivalent. Wait, hold, hold on. Uh, I just to, want to clarify to make sure you're saying what, what I think you're saying. You're saying that at any point of a child's upbringing up until the age of 18, the parent ought to have the right to not be the parent anymore or to not care for to the child. To put the child up for adoption, sure. But what if no one wants to adopt the baby or the, or the child at this point, I guess? That's devastating. We should make our adoption and uh, foster care system. But, but what happens in that case? This is pretty radical. To, I thought you were, I, you gave a, an answer that was relatively more reasonable than the pro-choice people on, on uh, viability, but then you've made a very radical argument here. You're, you're saying that, I, so one day I wake up, I've got my seven-year-old son, and I say, you know, I just don't want to be dad anymore. So, so long. I would, I would, I would assume if you're making that decision, if you're really just making it for realistically, like, I don't, you know, care about my kid, whatever, bye-bye kid. I'm assuming that you're probably like, you know, if how, it really how could you how could you make that decision not, not frivolous? Um, to put your child up for adoption? And, no, to, like you were at, saying, age, at age seven saying, to say I don't want to be your dad wait, anymore. Did you not say? Did you not say ten minutes ago that often putting a child up for adoption is what's best for the child? Yeah, not abandoning your seven-year-old kid. I'm saying no, putting a baby abandoned. up for adoption can can be in the interest of the child, but not abandoning your kid so that you, you've been if raising. You feel like 
Wait, you think we should ban, um, we, we should make it illegal to put children up for adoption? At, at, at what, age at seven? Age? Yeah. I, do, I mean, the reason that people are adopted at that age is because their kids are taken, from, because the children are taken away from the parents, because the parents are committing crimes, and Child Protective Services goes in and puts them in the horrible foster care system, and it's extraordinarily harmful right. for foster the child. Foster care system's terrible. We should, we should, be, we should but, improve the foster but, care but system. But the, the reason that the children are, leave the homes at age seven is not because the parents have some right to say, okay, I don't want to be mommy anymore. It's because they're committing crimes, and they're neglecting the children, and the children are taken away from them. Crimes? Crimes. Because do you think that they're a fit parent if they are committing crimes? I mean, would it not be better to not endanger the child and allow them to put it up for adoption? Also, I'm confused. Aren't we? No, I, no, I, I, I agree that Child Protective Services does have to go in at some points, but I'm not recommending that as a positive right that the parents have to abandon their children. It's because they're committing horrible crimes and child abuse that the children are taken away from them as a necessary consequence of their own so evil actions that they have you, no you right don't think to. You don't think parents should ever be able to sur surrender their parental rights and have maybe a family member obtain legal guardianship over a child? Should we make that process illegal? I'm confused what you're arguing. They, they, bad parents certainly can and do surrender their parental rights, but no, right. a parent does do not have a right to abandon legal? his child. We're not speaking. We're not speaking morally. We're speaking legally here. Should sh well, should an aunt not be able to adopt their you know ten year old uh, nephew? V Victoria, uh, no. I mean, sometimes that does happen, and, and that can be in the interest yeah. of the child if the mother is a terrible we're, mother right. or something. We're speaking but, legally but, here. We're not speaking morally. We're speaking legally. V Victoria, what, what do you think the law is? What do you mean? What is the distinction that you are drawing between morality and the law? So, so my, 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 the, law my is, point the law is the codification here, of morality. So, so my, my point here, I guess, is that um, no one should be legally forced to carry a child that they do not want. Similarly, after you give birth to a child, you are legally able to I, surrender so, your responsibility Victoria, as a parent. Victoria, I know that you are saying these things. I know you're making those declarative statements. I'm just asking why. Why is it that you, but what is the argument, the moral argument, that you believe that, because by the way, the laws are changing now on abortion and abortion is going to be illegal in a lot of the right. country. So what is the moral argument that you're making? as to why a mother should not be required to carry the baby. Because when we say not be required to carry the baby, we're saying kill the baby through abortion, unless we should establish two things. One, do you agree that the baby in the womb, call it a fetus, call it whatever you want, that he is alive and that he is human? Do you acknowledge those two things? Um, uh, is it a sentient viable life uh, before the point? Of I didn't ask that. I sentient? only a no. I didn't ask any of that. I only asked sure. human it's, it's and a alive. It's a biological um, life with human DNA. Sure. Okay. So it's a human life. So you would be ending a human life. You'd be killing a human being t if you commit an abortion. That follows inevitably from what you've just accepted as the premises. So that would seem to require a, uh, a pretty serious moral argument that takes into account the, the baby himself, the human being who's being killed. D do you have that argument? Right. So my perspective, morally speaking, and it's interesting because I did used to be pro-life. I was raised pro-life. And the biggest thing that uh, made an impact for me morally, because this is something I struggled with for a little bit, right, is just that especially when we look at these uh, lifelong complications that can uh, develop over the course of a pregnancy, how difficult a pregnancy can be on someone's body, and then additionally costs associated with giving birth. But Hold by the way, it is, it is worth... Okay, okay, fine. Okay. okay. My uh, point is that I am just in no position to judge uh, what someone else feels that they can realistically do or wants to do with their body, um, especially in so many different extenuating circumstances that a lot of people find themselves in when they're pregnant. But none of that takes into account the baby. I guess the point I was making is if, if we've acknowledged that the baby in the womb is human and alive, then surely any argument for killing that baby has to take it somewhere into account the baby and not merely the desires or wishes of the mother. Again, my, my perspective, and again, that's why I brought up the driving the car analogy, because I, I think it helps kind of put bodily autonomy in perspective without tying it to such a divisive issue. I don't think that cutting your bodily resources off from another being and therefore preventing uh, its life from being sustained, I don't think that that is morally equivalent to active murder or killing, even if, you know, the result is the same. The termination of the pregnancy is that, you know, that fetus will never live to be a child, if, whatever. If, if, a mother, if a mother or a father, for that matter, uh, abandoned their... Uh, 
three-month-old baby post-birth in a field somewhere, they would be charged with murder, at least negligent homicide, right? Well, we have um, we have structures in place that allow people to put children up for adoption. No, I, I know all way. of that, but I'm saying in, but in this case, they have withheld their care. This is, but this is the issue, though, is that we have those structures in place where you can surrender your child safely, and that's why not doing that is illegal. We do not have an equivalent no, when people are pregnant. We don't have no. this thing where you can just take an embryo out and put it in an incubator. Victoria, you, I think you're kind of putting the chicken before the egg, so to speak. You're suggesting that the reason that we have laws against the neglect and uh, homicide no. of children is because we have structures in place. You can drop them at the poli- no. at the fire department. But but that's not actually how it happens. We we have laws against those things, and we've had them in place much longer than we've had the fire department to drop the baby off at. We have laws against those things because it's intrinsically wrong to kill a baby and for a parent to to deprive the baby of food and shelter and, and protection. That's but why again, that came first. Talking- we're, so, so we're also conflating because there, there are two issues here with abortion, right? Just the idea of forced parenthood onto people, and then also They're the idea parents. of bodily autonomy. Again, expenditures of energy in terms of feeding your child, taking care of your child, are far different than um, sacrificing your own bodily resources in order to sustain that child's life. And for those reasons combined, I think that um, abortion should be legal, and I think everyone should have a right to it up until the point of viability. You. I know you, you are saying that, and I, I don't mean to sound uh, rude or something and to say that you have made this point multiple, I, but I, I guess all I'm asking for is, is there any aspect of your argument for abortion that actually takes on the humanity and the livingness, the aliveness of the baby himself? Or no, it's just all about the bodily autonomy of the mother. Uh, yeah, it's about the bodily autonomy of the pregnant person up until the point of viability. Not the mother, the pregnant person. Sure, yeah. Why, why did you change it to pregnant person? Um, because trans men can get pregnant <laughs> and anyone with the uterus can. I don't think that there's anything wrong with being a little bit more inclusive. I mean, I'm sure that there are trans Republicans who watch your, your show. I think it doesn't hurt to uh, be mm, a little not bit so kind sure. with the language. It's just amazing to me, though, that we would talk about being inclusive and being kind while we are defending the act of killing a baby. Now, not to be too harsh here on you. A non-sentient, but, non-viable fetus. One that's not even aware of its own existence. So, so if we want to talk about kindness. Do you, do you think it's fine? Do you think it, so if we're talking about sentience, do you think it would be fine to, uh, do you think it should be legal or is any way right to kill someone who is paralyzed, who can't feel things, no. who is not sentient? No, again, my primary Do you think it would be right to kill someone? Autonomy. I'm just- No, no, I, no but hold on. But Victoria, you've, ju- you've just- You've just raised this issue, so we should deal with it. You've said as though this were somehow a uh, you know slam dunk point for abortion. That well, the baby in the womb is not sentient or conscious or aware of his own existence. But right. there are plenty of people out here in the regular world who are not particularly sentient, namely people who are paralyzed, uh, people who are, let's say, in the throes of Alzheimer's are not particularly aware of their own existence, right? They're, they're very confused. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, when, when babies don't develop consciousness until it is now thought around five months after birth, they begin to develop the first tinges of consciousness. So the baby who has been born for the first five months does not have anything even resembling what you might call consciousness. Are you saying that it would be okay to kill that baby then? Because he's not more No, again, valuable? again, my primary, my primary concern, and this is why I support um, abortion rights up until the point of viability, my primary concern is with bodily autonomy. But then why did you bring up sentience and consciousness? Was, it, was, it was an aside because I think it's kind of funny that you compare, you know, the feelings of a fetus that is not aware of I'm, its own existence. I'm not talking about his with, feelings. You know, I'm talking about his life. Who's watching your show. But I'm not talking uh, about was, I'm talking about his life, well, not his feelings. Regardless, it was it was an, a, a side comment in terms of because when we think of kindness, right, we think of how the other person is feeling, right? In terms of is that correct when we're trying to no. be kind to someone? We're mostly no. Considering I how think of feeling. what is good no. and what is wrong. No, I don't. I don't primarily think with what what, what a person is feeling. I think about what is objectively oh. true and good and what is objectively false and evil. So I guess that might be a little bit of the disconnect here because I think yeah. that it is objectively you don't wrong. How other people are feeling. I, you don't I, consider how other as, people as feeling? a secondary effect. I do, but as primarily, a Christian, you're a Christian, right? I'm a Christian. I am Christian. Uh, are you? No, yeah, you don't consider how other people are feeling. I, I do as, as a secondary concern. I do, but not as my primary concern. Sure. I I, so, I care much well, more about just, what is objectively true and good. Well, 
I think that that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I think that, um, well, number one, we're really talking about why I use the term pregnant people. And I would actually love to touch on this for a second, because I know conservative arguments might, or conservative people might hear it and be like, that's a ridiculous argument. For me, um, yeah, m my primary concern is just with kindness. If someone's watching me, um, you know, have a debate on this, uh, Victoria, I, I just want to- Victoria, you are defending sure killing babies in the womb. Please, please do not tell me your primary <laughs> concern is kindness. All right, I won't get on my high horse, but all I'm all I'm saying is that, um, yeah, I don't think that there's anything wrong with inclusive language. I think it hurts no one, and if anything, it's just it's it's just a nice thing to do. You don't think it? Well, this is a sort of a side issue too. You don't think that uh, this language harms, uh, say, young girls? The, the language of transgenderism yeah. harms young girls who don't, for instance, don't want men to compete on their swim teams, or don't want young men to get naked in their oh, locker God. rooms, or don't uh, um, want men to go into their bathrooms. Well, when we're talking about trans women in sports, number one, it is such a uh, minimal issue uh, in terms of how many athletes are actually transgender. Not and to the girls who lost the, the Ivy League swim meet or the NCAA. I'm primarily, concerned, I'm primarily concerned with the way that female athletes are paid so much less than uh, their male counterparts. And in addition to <laughs> that, even when we're looking issue. at college... Uh, well, what, yeah. what about the what about the given? what about the concern of the girls whose trophies were stolen because the ideology that you're supporting let a giant man compete against them? Oh, or we can get into this. We can get into this. So when someone has been on hormone replacement therapy for an extended period of time, they uh, do not um, they do not demonstrate any significant advantages beyond just the natural variations that occur among cis women. Did you s well. you saw the NCAA championship? You saw the, the NCAA yeah. swimming championship. You saw that hulking guy, Will Thomas, standing next to those diminutative little girls, and he was in first place, and they were in second and third why, place. Why do you got to speak like that? Because when, it's when we're talking true. about these things, I, I know your perspective is different than mine, but number one, her name is Leah Thomas. Let's His name is William. Her, her, she, he is not a she. He's a man. And, it, Look, and I suppose you, this if actually... You believe, if I don't if believe... You don't believe if you don't believe trans women should be in women's sports, I think that that's wrong. I think that I completely disagree. I think that they pose no significant advantage. And even if they do, it is so incredibly minimal. It really doesn't affect anything. If you really care about women's sports, I think that we should focus more on women's sports wages. I don't care about women's sports at all, all but I do that, care about what's right. Regardless, regardless of all of that, when you disagree with people, I think it's important to show a little bit of respect, you know? I don't think it's respectful to anyone to indulge delusion. And I don't think it's respectful to the girls who are competing. And I don't think it's respectful Wait, to him. I'm, I'm sorry. What, what do you mean delusion? Delusion. The delusion of this man that he thinks that he's a woman. I think oh, that's what? not respectful to indulge his fantasies. Fantasies? Do you yeah. do you have any knowledge or understanding of gender dysphoria and how it functions or uh, the yeah, treatments? Yeah, reasonably. Right. I think more so than many of the uh, most popular commentators on the subject. Yeah, I think. All right. Are, well, I have a degree in psychology where I focused on uh, gender dysphoria quite a bit, and what I can tell you is that trans people, especially young trans people. Um, because of the social stigma associated with um, trans, being transgender, they are at an increased risk of bullying, suicidal ideation, and yeah. also uh, suicidal action, right? That's, that's and, true. Um, and that's all true. And, and it's also true that the surgeries don't, don't uh, statistically significantly reduce that risk of suicide. But even putting that to, oh, no, even putting no, that no, to no, the no, side. That's not true. Actually, social, that to the side. Social, wait, wait, this actually comes to the crux of my issue. Okay. Social transitioning is one of the... Um, Social transitioning reduces the rates of suicide, et cetera, the most out of um, out of everything that you can uh, reasonably do to help someone who is uh, transgender. And for that reason, I love to use inclusive language because yeah. even though it doesn't matter that much, you know. But uh, I, I guess it, well, it, th this actually does. This actually it, brings it, us back to the abortion question, uh, shockingly, which is uh, on on the point of whether or not the transgender uh, procedures reduce suicidality or depression. Uh, a lot of studies suggest that they don't, but you've got your studies, I've got my studies. Okay, fine. I, I, I guess the, the, what it's really coming down to is I think that a man is a man and that reality does not change even if he thinks that he's a woman and that it's not kind or tolerant or nice or warm to indulge what people might mistakenly believe is in his interest to indulge that delusion. I think it is, I think the truth sets you free and that lies are extremely cruel. And I guess this is my point on abortion as well. I don't think that indulging the fantasy or the delusion that the baby is not really a baby or that the mother is not really pregnant or that the baby doesn't have any moral worth or it's 
not a big deal and you were never pregnant in the first place. I don't think indulging those things uh, is in any way helpful to anyone, certainly not to the baby who is being killed and not to the mother that we're, that we're uh, lying to either. I think that that's a great, a great crime, especially, especially, uh, it's, it's not very kind to the baby who's, who's being killed. So, um, a few things. I look again, I used to be pro-life. I understand, you know, why you're pro-life and why uh, you view this as such a crucial moral issue. Right. Do, but, um, do you, I still don't understand. I don't understand the whole refusing to just like, I don't know, use inclusive language or call people proper pronouns. I mean, there's definitive evidence that it helps. Their, their proper pronoun for a man who thinks he's a woman is he, that's the proper pronoun. The, the fake, no, the delusional pronoun, be, it would be, be she. Or they. But regardless, regardless, there's a plural people, pronoun. It does a, not refer to a, single individuals hey, unless they're okay, infested by on, demons. Hold on, Mr. Mr. Pro-Life, yeah. there's substantial evidence that this reduces suicidal ideation and action. So there why, isn't. why there do you There isn't, but even, even if there were, we shouldn't no, deny reality is, for I that. Studied, I studied, I studied this I'm, in school. I'm so why, very impressed that you've studied you so psychology concerned? in college, but uh, why, there isn't a lot of why evidence for And even if there were words if it could save someone's life possibly because social it, transitioning yeah. because one it, it won't but two because i it because a lot you in any way at all well like uh, no no i mean the evidence that currently exists yeah, is that it doesn't but do who cares? Much. but I'm sorry. look at, i i the, i was raised in the south right we call we call everyone you know ma'am sir yes ma'am no sir right thank you you're welcome manners respect why is that so difficult for you? Because it's not respectful to call, it is respectful to call a, yes. a sir, sir, and a woman, ma'am. It is not respectful to call a, a mentally ill man, she, just because he is under some delusion. It's actually very harmful to him to do that. And the point that you're raising is really interesting here, because regardless, we could bicker exactly. back and forth all day over what the studies show about reduced rates of suicidality or whatever. But really what you're saying is, if an end is good enough, it justifies an immoral means. So if the end of reducing depression rates among uh, people who think, who struggle with their sex, if, if that end is in sight, then it justifies the immoral me uh, means of lying, of lying about the man and his pronouns and who he really is, right? That not lying. If he's a man and you're calling him a woman, that's lying. Um, Gender is a social construct, and this and this is something that we've seen culturally um, in different cultures and different countries. We have seen uh, a gender identity exist outside of the gender binary. We've seen uh, transgender people exist for centuries and be either very accepted or very shunned by the communities. So, uh, uh, Victoria, you, you're sa you're no. saying this. You are making that statement. I know, but it isn't true, and you're not explaining why it's true. Wait, what do you mean? That gender is a social construct? Gender is a way to describe nouns in language as masculine or feminine. And the way that we use it with regard to human sexuality, it popularly is a very modern concept that dates back about half a century. And really what there is, is sex. And sexes are male and female. And they have attributes such as masculine and feminine. And certain men can be more feminine than other men, and certain women can be more masculine than others. But th this does not change the natural relation between sex and what you would call gender. And it does not in any way suggest that a human being can be a man by all biological markers, but secretly be a woman. That would be what's known as Gnostic dualism. It would be the suggestion that a person's metaphysical quality uh, is, is one at odds with one's physical characteristics, and two, that one's metaphysical characteristics is his real identity, and, and that in a case of a conflict between the metaphysical and the physical, the physical must be entirely rejected. So that a guy like Will Thomas, who looks obviously like a dude, and he wore a tight bathing suit, and we all saw it, if he thinks deep down on some metaphysical level that he's really a woman, then he actually is. That is a, a, an ancient religious concept. It's completely ridiculous. And so you can make the statement, gender is a social construct, which continues contains it all is of that. Social construct. It, it, it but, is a but social it, construct. But that isn't true, as yeah, I've just explained. Culturally, for, for example, for example, indigenous groups, um, there there was not this strict uh, gender binary. There were people who were 
considered spirit people, which existed somewhere outside of these strictly masculine or strictly feminine, and they were actually regarded very highly by their communities. So this is something that has ex has existed throughout uh, human certain, history. Certain for, pagan, for, for tribes, certain pagan tribes, certain pagan tribes have I, done and said a lot of things that are very mistaken, including notably human sacrifice. So if you look at the uh, indigenous tribes well, of, of hold the. On. Hold on. Well, it brings Hold us on. back Number to our topic one, it's at hand. Ridiculous that, it's ridiculous that you're equating being transgender with human sacrifices. And then number no, two, I'm not. Again, I'm just saying that it, the indigenous tribes you're invoking practiced all sorts of crazy ideas, and uh, a lot of them were mistaken, like human again, sacrifice and transgender. So, social transitioning has proven to reduce rates of depression and suicidal ideation. I know, but we, we've... I, I think I, that I, that I, is something no, no, important no. to consider, and I think that that's what makes respecting transgender people very different than I, uh, human sacrifice. Sure. Though I reject your statistics, I, I guess even if your statistics were accurate, which I, I don't think they are, but even if they yeah. were, I guess the point then comes down to I don't think that the ends justify the means. And this does bring us back finally to abortion. I know I've, ke I've kept you long over the limit, but this does bring us back to abortion because you, you started out talking about the, the issue of rape, which obviously accounts for a very, very small number of abortions every year. But it's a, obviously it's a very hard case. It's such a tragic case. You, you have some woman who's been victimized and she carries her child, but the child, which is also her rapist's child, and uh, would, would then carry that child for nine months and either raise the child or, or put the child up for uh, uh, adoption. And this is a very, very hard case. There's no question about that. And the question becomes, in order to potentially alleviate this woman's suffering, uh, would it be licit to commit an action that we would all, I think, agree is immoral, namely killing a baby that you acknowledge is human and alive. What, what does the end justify the means there? And I think quite clearly it does not because it's fictional. It's a lie. The baby really is a baby, whether you pretend the baby is or not. And if anyone has a right to life, certainly that baby has a right to life, whether you want the baby to or not. And the lie, the, the, the dishonesty is not going to take away the crime that was committed against that woman. It's not going to take away the suffering that people feel. It's not going to undo any of that. And in fact, in practice, this, I think it's going to make it all a lot worse. So I've got a question for you because I know that it's easy to kind of um, ignore the reality of the legislation that we advocate for, right? About real people. Sorry, you're, you're, Victoria, so you're, you're uh, breaking up again. We might have to, are you there? Can I hear you? Nope. Yeah. There we are. Okay. So I lost you at, yeah. it's easy to deny the reality of the legislation. So I, I think that when we have debates like this, it's it's easy to kind of ignore the reality of legislation that we advocate for. So, you know, a 14 year old who is raped, um, you look at that child and you say, hey, I know that this was incredibly traumatic for you. I know you want nothing more than this to just be over and done with. But actually, you have to sacrifice nine months of your childhood and deal with risks of pregnancy and possible lifetime complications as a result of pregnancy, too. For a I should child I should point this out not even consent to being put inside of you. Like do you think that that's moral? Because I understand your qualms with abortion, but I think at the very it's, least you can it's understand not a qualm. It's a, you know, <laughs> my qualm is that it's wrong to kill innocent little babies, Victoria. I think at the very I, well, I, I think at the very least you can understand you know a yeah, little it's a, bit. Yeah, it's it's a it, it is a it, it is a, a an expression you. of the tragic fact of the human condition that that bad things happen to people and that they're the victims of crimes and all sorts of horrible things. Right. And so what you, what you're saying that. is what right i'm saying one it would not alleviate the pain to encourage a mother to not kill encourage. her child or not to, to oh, wow. and it would not alleviate obviously not the pain of the child and it would not it does it does not alleviate any pain it is an immoral action that is intrinsically wrong and so when so, we're when we're talking about abortion by the way in 99% plus of abortions what we're talking about is a mother who has consented to sex, who is not 12 years old, who is, not, who is a perfectly ordinary grown woman who has consented to sex, who in, in the callousness of our own culture has determined that her convenience and her preference and her sheer will, absent any logic or reason or charity, requires that she kill her own child in her womb. It's very easy to ignore the reality of the legislation that we're advocating, as you just mentioned, Victoria. That That is something that is very easy to ignore, except we're talking about a living baby. And this is why, by the way, the pro-life movement has gained so much steam, is because now with sonograms, you can actually see that baby. And you can see it's not a clump of cells. It's a little human being, and you're killing that baby. There, there was an 
You, you, I, I, have, I have two questions for you before you, we before we move on. Number one, uh, you know, I, I noticed you do this a, a lot is refer to, you know, pregnancy as maybe inconvenient. And I like, do you think that type yeah. two diabetes, cardiovascular disease? Uh, Victoria, Victoria how, 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 how lethal do you think pregnancy is? You like an inconvenience to me. Victoria, how, le how lethal do you think pregnancy really is? Forcing, forcing someone legally to be at an increased risk for all of these things. I think that that is far more, even if you are pro-life, you cannot simply say that that is an- Victoria, so now, now we're in the, but we're, we're talking in the realm here. Victoria, Victoria, we're talking now in the realm here of the 99% plus of abortions that are, uh, it, it occur because of consensual sex. And mm -hmm. you, what you are saying is that uh, a woman and a man consent to have sex the right. natural consequence of which is creating a baby. And then uh, one day the mother has another thought and says, you know, I, I'm afraid of some of the risks with pregnancy, which are extraordinarily low, by the way. M maternal mortality is very, very low, and it's not nearly not as dangerous as you're suggesting. Mortality. I'm talking about lifelong complications that result um, lifelong complication. Birth. Lifelong complications are extraordinarily rare as well, but there are some. I'm not denying that they exist. And, there are, and it's yeah. extremely inconvenient, and it changes the way your body looks, and that's true. And so further, further, it is inconvenient, but further on down, it's also miraculous and wonderful. Way worse than but inconvenient. There, there are yes, there are there are risks that we have when we right. consent to sex. And then what you're saying is that when sex doesn't go the way that you hoped it would, which is merely for your pleasure without creating a new life, that you therefore are justified in killing your own child because you're afraid of relatively slight risks that you yourself have consented to when you had sex. Is that really the moral argument you're making? Again, going back to the car analogy, I know I never really got a definitive answer from you on I that. I know, I was trying but to get a definitive picture of the car analogy. But. Right, okay, so me driving, understanding the risks, stoplight down, doesn't work. I accidentally cr crash into someone, let's say it is a is the st So the stoplight is a, is a condom, basically? That's what you're sure. saying? Well, the, po the point I'm trying to make is by by the way in which I was driving was not illegal because sex isn't illegal, right? So the way in which I was driving was not illegal, whatever. I get into a car accident. Right, but, but certainly case. sex outside of marriage is not morally well, illicit. So yes, you are already... Wait, do wait yeah. what? Yeah. You I don't think... You think sex outside of marriage is morally wrong? Remember, Victoria, remember earlier when you said, Michael, you're a Christian, right? I'm a Christian too. Christians oh. <laughs> believe that sex outside of marriage is not morally licit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I thought we got past all of that. I'm not going to lie. But regardless. We did not. We did giving, not. Yeah. Well, and I'm by the way, I'm speaking of Christianity. Christians than you are. I'm sorry? Uh, I said maybe I'm just hanging out with cooler Christians than you are. You're hanging I, out I with somebody. You're, you're saying, I yeah. want to get back to the part but, but hold on. This is an important point, too, because you mentioned the Christianity here. It is yeah. important to remember that going back through the entire history of the church, going all the way back to the second century, to the Didache, the earliest documents we have, uh, cr the Christian church has held abortion to be immoral, to be wrong. It, it, th not, this is not a recent development. This is nothing new. It hasn't really changed over time. This is 2,000 years almost of Christianity saying it is wrong. It is intrinsically wrong for a mother to kill her baby. And so for you to call yourself a Christian and then to advocate for this, is, I'm, I, I, I'm not saying this to be holier than thou, but that is, a, that is heretical. It's sacrilegious. And if you really believe in Christianity, that's a, a mortal risk to your soul. Damn, I'll have to pray about that one later. You For should. me, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think my faith should in any way, shape, or form affect legislation. So that legislation I advocate for will be completely removed from my faith. How, but then, in addition well, to that, how, I, Victoria, how is that possible? You're, if, what do you mean? When when one proposes or supports legislation, we do so yeah. because we think it is good or bad. And right. It, right. And so where do we get our notions of good and bad? If your notions of good and bad are not in any way informed by your faith, then what is your faith? No, no. My, my notion of, um, see, I think everyone has this uh, kind of intrinsic sense of right versus wrong, right? And so if we mm -hmm. really want to get into, I mean, I know we're getting a little it's bit called off a conscience. the rails, yeah. I do want to come back to our analogy. But in terms of uh, where I use religion is I use Christianity to help guide my some of my decision-making processes, right, based on my, my moral compass. So when we look at universal health care, when we look at immigration, you know, I was taught growing up to serve everyone, serve my community uh, first. I was taught to take care of the sick. I was taught to welcome the stranger. So what, what you're saying, this is a very interesting thing you're saying. So, so what what you're is, saying is that for you- things are more important to me this, than so what, abortion. Right, so what you're saying is for you, Christianity is good because sometimes 
it goes along with your own personal moral intuitions. That's what you're saying, right? You're no. saying you use it to inform your personal moral conscience, your personal moral intuitions. No, but not on um, abortion. I, Where the, the Christian church could not possibly be more clear. Abortion which, is simply which Bible wrong. Verse, which Bible verse men mentions abortion explicitly? Well, the church predates the Bible, by the way, and the church compiled the, church. the Bible. Which, which but Bible verse mentions abortion th explicitly? Thou shalt not no. kill. That's the Bible verse. Yeah, but abortion and killing are Let two the little very children things. come to me. He is who, he who leads the littlest among is, these away is, will have millstones. But yeah. Is God all knowing? Is God all knowing? Yes. So if God had one strong stance on abortion one way or another, don't you think that he would have some understanding that this would be a huge moral dilemma? Even within well, the he, church, yeah, there, he, he there does. are uh, religious leaders that do not view abortion as murder. And, and No, so there, are, there are schismatics and heretics who if, say those things, abortion, but there are not leaders of the church who say those things. If abortion and it, is It would not so, be illicit if they did. If abortion is so objectively wrong to God, why didn't he explicitly state he it? Did he did on Mount Sinai. Like he knew that this would be an issue. He, he so did, he, he did on Mount Sinai. Victoria, you've already conceded that the baby in the womb is human and living. Therefore, it would seem to me he's covered by thou shalt not commit murder. But again, again, would it be murder in the car analogy? And I really want to stay on this. Just stay with me. Just just answer this Mur one question. Well, mur in murder, Victor analogy. Victoria, it's, it's worth pointing out. Murder is an intentional killing, right? This is, why we, this is why we uh, distinguish between uh, murder and homicide. But again, I think if you get accidentally pregnant, then in the same way as with a car accident, you are accidentally putting that person in a state of dependency but, on your own body. Victoria, one right? does not so get accidentally pregnant, though, as, as you've just described. In, in, but haven't you just, we, that's what, this is what we were just talking about. In at least 99% plus of, of cases of abortion, the person didn't get accidentally pregnant. The person had sex, the natural consequence of which is pregnancy. The natural risk of which is pregnancy, similar to risk. driving a car. What, what do you think, natural, Victoria? Do you do you think that do you think that having a child a is some kind of sexually transmitted disease? This is a risk to be avoided. This is the greatest miracle that you can possibly uh, experience, and it's it's the natural t loss of the human person. Wait, do you have kids? I do. Okay, well, <laughs> they must be really well behaved. <laughs> they no, they're not well behaved. They're, but you even mean? that suffering is still worth it. And let me tell you, there's a lot of screaming, so there is there can be a lot of suffering. My, my uh, we're getting so off the rails. I do just really, really want to uh, drive home this car analogy, though. Uh, <laughs> okay, this, okay, we'll do the car analogy, and then and then we got to get out. Thank you, thank you. And then I'm done. Never okay. mentioning a car again. Uh, in, in this analogy where you, you know, get into a car accident, you're not illegally driving in any way, whatever. Someone, let's say a child who could not reasonably consent. To well, it, but, in but in the, so here, I guess here would be the first issue of with the analogy is I am saying that it is immoral to have sex outside the bounds of marriage. So th th oh. the analogy there would be that you are illegally driving in your case when you're talking about an unexpected pregnancy. So that would be the first little chink that would be in the armor of, of, Wait, so should we make uh, should we make sex outside of marriage illegal? We should strongly discourage it at the very least. And we used to have lots of laws it against it. We should we should we should at least uh, strongly discourage it. If the, if it were at the local, we have law. We've had laws against adultery. We've had plenty of laws in America against fornication. There is a practical and prudential matter of this, which is you don't you don't want to fill up the jails with a lot of frisky teenagers. And we've had a culture of of promiscuous sex for fifty years now in this country. So there's a prudential matter of how do you encourage a culture of life. But no, I don't think we should encourage casual sex. I think it's harmful for everybody involved. Spreads disease. It causes lots of abortions and a lot of pain. Yeah. I am curious, how do you, and now I'm just kind of asking questions because this is kind of fascinating to me, to meet someone with your uh, perspective. Um, where do you fall on the political spectrum? Are you a libertarian? Are you like no. traditional conservative? What are you? Yeah, I'm, a, cons I'm a conservative. More, more you're traditional. just strongly anti-sex. You're like sex. No, I'm, I'm very pro-sex. You know, the Catholics are the most pro-sex people out there. We, we all have like a dozen kids, don't we? I'm, I'm behind the eight ball. I've got to catch up. I need a whole little oh. litter of them. You know, I've only got, I've only got a couple so far. So, okay. So, well, then there you go. Then, then, um, very pro you know, I'm very sex positive. The, oh, right. Within the bounds of marriage. Yeah. So the most positive kind of sex there is. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you were illegally driving then. Why not? Um, and, and should, should the government be able to legally, uh, force you to hook yourself up to someone? Well, you already, you already said just I was illegally you know, driving. You're already saying that I've, I've already committed that. Well, I'm, that I'm now I'm just curious. So you're saying I'm what would be the punishment for illegal driving? Time. I don't know. I'm, I'm more, uh, in, in favor of a speeding ticket. 
uh, than anything right. else. But no, I and, and, and to, and to your point, you. what's interesting about your analogy, and it's the same thing that's interesting about the violinist analogy, is you're saying, uh, do I have this obligation to my fellow man? Or do I have some right that supersedes that obligation? And w- the thing is, we do have obligations to all of our fellow men because we are all part of humanity. And in the case of citizens, we're all part of the same country and certainly in the local community and most especially in the family. So while I'm, I might dispute my obligation to give my kidneys as dialysis for a man who, with whom I get in a car accident, and I think I don't really have that strong of a natural obligation to do it, when we're talking about a, a more local and personal relationship, when we're talking about the relationship between a mother and a child, or a father and a child for that matter, yes, I think that obligation does hold. You mentioned that pregnancy comes with all sorts of problems for women, and it causes them at the very least to gain weight, and they could have some problems during pregnancy, and they could have some problems even after pregnancy. And I'm not denying that any of that is true. We sacrifice for the ones that we love, and we have a natural obligation to sacrifice for and love our own children. If, and if that obligation doesn't hold, then none of us has any obligation to anyone else. Um, and, and again, I'm just asking this question out of curiosity. It's not a gotcha moment. But um, if your child experienced organ failure, do you think the government should be able to legally require that you donate those organs? I would, to that I would donate those organs. Yeah. Right. You would, but should you, should the government legally require that everyone do that? That everyone donate organs to their kids? If, if their child experiences uh, organ failure, should, should the government be able to legally require that people give their organs to yeah, their I'm, children? I'm not, I guess I'm not opposed to it in principle. In practice, I guess it would be kind of hard to work out exactly how that, how that happens because you'd have, you'd have to match various blood types and, and different parents right. and guardians it's, and things. If, if you, but in, in principle, yeah. But the, the thing is also that in a healthy and functioning society, you don't need to uh, make rigid laws about all of these things. You don't need to make rigid laws about what time mommy gives milk to the baby in a healthy and functioning society. In a society with breakdown, then increasingly you need to put more of those laws on the books. But, but if your question at the higher level of law is, does a, a parent have an obligation to do what he can to protect his child? Yes, of course. And I think that that is where... Um you know, we fundamentally disagree. So I think it'd be a huge overreach of government power to uh, force someone to give their organs or let's say even a limb. Your kid loses their arm. Okay, you're forced to give them, you know, a limb or yeah, something. I, don't, I think it would look <laughs> weird if my little baby had my giant limb off of his shoulder. I think, I think it would be uh, pretty strange too. But I, I just think it would be a huge overreach of uh, government power to be able to force people to make such personal, personal medical decisions like that. And it seems like that's where we just fundamentally disagree. Um, you know, I, and, and that's but, why but I'm, not, I'm not advocating passing a law that, that takes my kidneys away or anything like that. I, I but right, I, 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 I am, uh, no, I mean, but I, I certainly would give that kidney and I suspect all parents would. I suspect so pretty much every parent in this country think, would. You don't, you don't think the government should legally mandate it. You still think that it should be a choice. Even I don't, I don't think it's re- necessary to legally mandate these sorts of things, but, but I, you know, I, I certainly think that as society breaks down, obviously, uh, one has to ma- to mandate more of these things. For instance, you we have to pass laws support. that say you're not allowed to kill your baby in the womb. You you, you would support that uh, that law though that would require parents to give organs to their children if their children. Oh, no, I them. might or I might or I might not. I guess I'd have to l- use my prudence and my reason to right. look at the conditions of the society in, in which this was being raised. But if if it was a problem where parents weren't giving their organs to their children, you think the government should be? Well, able why to are these children all them? experiencing organ failure? This is a relatively a rare condition. So I guess there would probably be an epidemiological problem and, right. and solution. Probably like global warming and pollution got really bad, and we're in the situation where people's organs are breaking down. Maybe should I keep waiting. I keep waiting for the world to end. I was told it was going to end already, and it hasn't yet. But well, maybe, maybe soon yes enough. Or no. yeah. Yes or no? This. Bill shows up. You're, let's say, you have the power to pass this bill. Would you pass that bill? That to, would require to, today. To today, no, no, it's not a widespread problem. Why? And it, so, because so it's addressing that a problem that doesn't exist. Well, okay. So it, let's say that it was more common. Would you support that bill? No, I would, I would, prob- no? I would probably put funding uh, toward uh, uh, epidemiological research to figure out why kids' organs were failing. Exactly, which is my exact stance on abortion. This actually ties this all together very well. Although, I, although I would, I, hold on, I, I do want to couch that too, is because I, I, I want to let you make your point. But I also, if you had this spate 
in the country in this wild hypothetical of parents just being callously indifferent to the suffering and death of their own children, I would probably pass some laws. I don't know if I'd pass the take your kidney out law, but I'd probably pass some laws about, I don't know, you know, uh, minimizing divorce or uh, I don't know, maybe at least the parents have to take a class on a Sunday about how not to abuse their children. Or uh, You know, there would be a lot of structural problems going on in the society well, if that, if that were occurring. Regardless, regardless, yeah. um, regardless, I think, uh, Wait, I was, I was going to make, okay, I, I remember my point. I think um, what you said about, you know, if there are tons of kids in the situation where parents needed to give organs, you would look at the <laughs> systemic causes of those issues. That is my exact stance on abortion. I understand that abortion can be difficult, like we were talking about earlier, right? I'm not like, oh, woohoo, you know, I hope that we see a million more abortions this year. I understand that it can be difficult, especially when you maybe don't want to have one, but feel like you have to. And so for me, instead of just banning abortion, what I am taking that choice away from people, hmm. similar to, you know, if you were able to pass legislation that would force but, parents. But let's to say, let's say, I, I see your point here, Victoria, but, let, on, let, but, but there, there's, I, you're, you're conflating two things that are very one different. One last thing home. Let me just okay. drive it home and then you can, and then you can refute it. But um, similarly, I would love to see pro-lifers and pro-choicers come together to look at some of the systemic causes of abortions and in instances where people might not even want to get an abortion, but feel like they have to. I think that that's a really big problem that not enough people spend time on. Sure. I know. I agree. And I think lack of education is a big problem there. Uh, yeah. But I, I guess the, the things you're conflating here is you're conflating a parent not to uh, in one of the examples, chopping off his arm to attach to the baby or the child, which uh, would be impractical, but uh, also would, it would, but it would not be intrinsically evil for the parent not to cut his own arm off and, and sew it onto the child. Whereas it would, it is intrinsically evil to kill a baby through abortion. And so I guess a better, a better analogy that I would use is let's say there were a spate in America of people stealing candy bars. And for whatever reason, overnight, candy bar theft has gone up through the roof and, and drugstore owners are really suffering because of this. What would I do? I certainly would fund studies, scientific studies, to figure out why people are stealing all of these candy bars. What is it about Snickers that they can't resist? But I would also, because the action of theft is intrinsically immoral, I would also outlaw it, candy bar theft if it, were, if it were not already illegal and prosecute it when people are caught and put more cops on the street to catch the candy bar thieves. And when, if there were an industry, let's say, that existed to facilitate the stealing of candy bars, I would end that industry and, and put the people who were running it in prison. I think that would be the closer analogy for abortion. Because, um, because what is in, in, intrinsically in instance, evil is the key in the, here. In the, in the instance where, um, you know, but there's no uh, personal sacrifice anyone has to make in order to, like, outlaw, um, you know, candy bar theft in the same way no, we that... we do. I, I have to pay more money to the government. I need, we need Hold to pay on. more for cops. We need to... Hold on. We need to be vigilant um, in our neighborhoods. Yeah. You, you already said, though, if we're talking about like kidneys instead of limbs, that, that is a bit ridiculous. But uh, kidneys should, again, I asked you, should parents be legally required by the government to uh, no, donate no, that, that would be, rather organs to their children that, if they are a match? And you said no. That would, be an ex so, that would be an extraordinary action. And I don't think they would be bound by natural law, for instance, to, to do that in the same way that they would be bound by natural law not to kill their autonomy baby. to sustain the life of their children. Exactly. You don't think that someone no, no, should no, have but, to sacrifice but, their bodily autonomy to sustain the life of their children. But, but Victoria, those are, those are different things. I, it begins nowhere from the point of bodily autonomy. It's everywhere from the point of order and what is moral and virtuous and, and good. And so there, there is a moral obligation that you have on you not to kill your own child. You are morally obligated to do that. Do you have that same obligation to not let your child die if you're able to save no, them? Your, chi your child will die. Your child is going to die someday, and you're going to die someday, and we're all going to die someday. So na natural, de natural them. death if is not able to save them. If you are able to save them, if you're able to save them. I, I think you certainly have an obligation and, and a right. natural desire to try to save your baby as you can. But this does not justify all extraordinary means. This is why it would be morally licit, for instance, to take someone off of extraordinary life support and why that is different than helping someone to commit suicide. Those are, those are uh, they seem superficially to be similar scenarios, but they're not because this is the natural world and there are limits. And, and as you say, we are all going to die someday. None of us has a right to live forever. And natural death can occur even at a very young age, which is tragic, but it, it can happen. So the, the difference here is between what would be ordinary and natural and what would be extraordinary. 
Well, I'm kind of confused why you see uh, uh, organ donation as extraordinary and pregnancy is not extraordinary. Well, because pregnancy is a perfectly natural process that's occurred a long time before any lab coats walked onto the scene and before modern medical technology, and it's the natural uh, I don't think that medical of, technology of has anything to do with how extraordinary something is. I mean, do you think like UTI it, it, medicine is just extraordinary? I don't yeah, think how yeah. long it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I think I think yeah. modern medical advances are, are astonishing and quite extraordinary. It, and they didn't um, exist for a long time. So yes, that's true. Whereas uh, if one, if I could donate a kidney to my kid, if he needed it, God forbid, I, I would be happy to do it. But that would require doctors, modern medical care, uh, big laboratories to so, develop this kind of research. So th th those are all wonderful things that have, have occurred. But but that, that is a little different than what we're talking about, which is a mother's natural obligation not to so kill in, her own in, kid. In your kind of, in your kind of like mindset, um, when we're talking about like letting things die or killing them, um, and you're well, those not, are different and things, but yeah. In, 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 your, in your mindset, you think that it is morally acceptable, I guess, to let your child die um, instead no. of donating their organs. No, because, no, I, uh, I, I think if uh, advancements. No, I, I think that uh, if you can save the life of your child, you certainly ought to do that, and that would that would be a good and thing. And should you be legally but, required to do that? That's what I'm asking. Well, should I, you be legally would, required to do I, I'm not in favor of laws that address problems that don't exist. And so, as I answered earlier, I, I suppose I would have to apply my prudence and reason if that situation did present itself. But that is a very uh, different scenario than the a widespread practice right now of killing over 800,000 babies per year, uh, very frequently by poisoning and dismembering, just always so by poisoning so them and sometimes by dismembering yeah. them. Yeah, that would be very different. Just, just so we're clear, though, you, you would not support legislation that would require you to donate an organ um, in order to sustain your own child's life. You, no, you, you wouldn't support passing that legislation. I, I, don't, I don't think that ne legislation is necessary to address a pressing social problem, no. But if it was a pressing social pro problem, would you uh, support would would you support that legislation, or would you have a problem with it? No, that that would seem to go beyond the bounds of natural obligation, though. I so, I, you, so you wouldn't support uh, passing that law. Uh, if uh, there were a widespread problem, well, I don't know. I don't know. It would depend on the circumstances. I'm not I'm not in principle opposed to such a law, but I'm not in, I'm not in principle uh, clamoring for it either. I think that. Uh, Prudence is, is often a very good guide to politics, more so than uh, you know some sort of grand ideological statement for an uh, outrageous hypothetical uh, in, in the so, abstract. So you're so, so you're possibly okay with uh, you know parents deciding to favor their bodily autonomy over the life of their child. No, you're I think I think, okay but but to, to to use a, a real example of of your wild hypothetical, let's say that in this hypothetical world, uh, the child were extraordinarily sick. Obviously, he is. He's experienced organ failure, and uh, things are really not looking good. And the prospect of some of these organs really taking and not being rejected by the body is extraordinarily low. And even if they are accepted, the idea that that, that it will help him in the long run seems unlikely. And probably maybe it'll only give him an extra five or six months, and it will dramatically reduce, uh, you know, uh, the I don't know your. Uh, ability to care for your other children. And you have to take these kind of prudential matters into consideration. That's why I don't, I'm, not, I'm saying that you don't have an eternal at all times ideologized uh, uh, rule that you have to do this. But uh, if, if one so you think applied- people's circumstances, You think people's circumstances can make certain decisions very difficult for them? I think, I think, because I think of those, prudence because is- Because of those difficulties, maybe we should reserve from judgment or- uh, No, no, I'm, or, I'm not uh, reserving from judgment. Of these decisions. No, no, I'm, I'm not reserving from judgment. I am engaging, I no, think, just, quite, just quite- uh, Criminalization. Quite. Criminalization. Because that's the reality, right? It's not that every pregnancy is some- you know, walk in the park where, oh, I just casually had sex and I actually wanted to get pregnant, but now I actually just want to have a cute little abortion. It is so rare that anything like that happens. There I mean, are so the many extraneous circumstances that could cause someone to want to have an abortion. Right, but what, so what are, what are those circumstances? He already has three kids and is also at an increased risk of gestational but, diabetes and type 2 but, diabetes. But the mother knew all of that before she had uh, sex. The mother knew all of that before she had sex, right? We're, talk, we're talking about 99% plus, plus of, of abortions, right? So in but all of those- also, you, also don't, you also don't support abortion in cases of rape. So that woman, that woman who's dealing that, with all these extenuating circumstances, she too, you would force to carry that pregnancy to term and you cannot hide from that just because it's a small percentage. No, uh, you would so, force that person to continue their pregnancy yeah, and I, deliver. 
Well, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not forcing pregnancy. Pregnancy already exists, and I'm not forcing birth. Birth will occur regardless. I am saying that it is always wrong to kill a baby, even in, in the 99 plus percent of cases where uh, sex is consensual, and even in the, in the very rare but very, very hard cases in which someone has been victimized by a terrible crime. Uh, yes, and none of those things justifies the killing of, of a little baby. I'm kind of confused why you keep bringing up the uh, low rape statistic, even in uh, in situations like this, where I didn't even mention it, because clearly you see some moral difference. Between, no, no, because uh, it's a much harder circumstance because the woman is a victim. And so one naturally feels right. a far greater sympathy or empathy for that person. But right. but you nevertheless, the, 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 tra- the tragic fact of the way that a, a human being is conceived, a person that you have already acknowledged is human and is alive, uh, the, the tragic fact of his conception uh, or the less tragic fact of his conception does not have any bearing on his humanity or on his life. So I, I mention it as distinct because obviously it's distinct when we talk about it and it's a tragic circumstance. But uh, in terms of the the baby himself, in terms of the, the right to life and the obligations of a mother to her child, it doesn't change anything. I just find it interesting that in the first example of uh, someone uh, making decisions about their own body, their bodily autonomy in terms of organ donation to one's children, I just think that it's interesting that you were actually the one who brought up extenuating circumstances in those in, in those no, cases, ex- but any but anytime, said, yeah. but any but anytime we talk about uh, difficult circumstances as it relates to pregnancy, yeah, pre- you just pregnancy go back is and, oh, not well, pregnancy crazy. is not extraordinary. I mean, imagine, pregnancy imagine, is ordinary and natural, and it's actually imagine, the center of human imagine, life. Imagine in the situation where someone is having to make the very difficult decision of, you know, whether or not they're going to give up an organ to sustain their own child's life. If everyone was like, oh, so you're going to kill your child. You know what I mean? That's what you say about abortion every time. But just now. Right. Because in in, in the case. You almost justified the decision to not give an organ to a child. So I'm confused why you see one is so black and white. It's murdering a child. And the other one is. Because one in 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 your hypothetical, you are describing an, an extraordinary circumstance circumstance in in, in an extraordinary action. And in when we're talking about a, a pregnancy and abortion, we're talking about perfectly natural, ordinary things. And so your one's natural moral obligations apply in, you don't a, in think a different way. a human being inside of you for nine months is extraordinary. It's, it's miraculous, it to, but it's not. It's, lifelong complications. No, it's, it's miraculous and it's wonderful. And it's inconvenient sometimes, as I pointed out, and uncomfortable, but it's not Are extraordinary. It's, it's not it, inconvenient. It is very, uh, very harmful. It, it's, they're, they're, no, it's not, harm, it's not harmful. Like, it's it's life giving. But but cardiovascular uh, disease. Yes, it can. It involves. It, it can involve pain and discomfort and and risk. I'm not denying any of that. But it, you said that pregnancy is extraordinary. I guess in our society, with plunging birth rates, increasingly it is. But it's not. It's the most ordinary thing in the world. It's it's the center of society. Without pregnancy, there is no such thing as society. So yes, of course, it's the most ordinary thing that there is in society. It's perfectly perfectly plain and natural. I think that asking someone to give up their bodily resources like that, no matter if it's natural or unnatural, the, the I think person, that would be uh, the, the reason we also make the distinction between the very rare case of rape and 99% plus of abortions, which occur in, in case of consensual sex, is the person already consented to giving up one's resources when the person consented to have sex. Because the natural so consequence of sex, sex is pregnancy. Is, cons- is consent to pregnancy. Yes. So then do you also believe that melanoma, consenting to suntanning is consent to melanoma? Well, you certainly understand the risk when you go suntanning. And yeah. consenting to, you know, driving is consenting to a car crash. You're, yes, like, you're accepting like, the risk, yeah. You're accepting the risk of Right, accepting crash. the but, risk. But, but except, I, except when, when one goes does out... That mean we should, no, no, but there's a big distinction. Do there, people there, who no, get there, melanoma because that was the natural no, consequence no, 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 of their action. Victoria, there's, there's a big distinction. When one goes out to, to tan in the sun... The purpose of that is to look nice and bronzed and maybe look a little bit like Donald Trump. An unintended consequence of that, or an extraordinary or unnatural consequence of that, or abnormal or broken or fallen consequence of that, could be that you you get some kind of melanoma. When you get in the you car- think melanoma the, is un, uh, unnatural or abnormal? It is quite literally a natural reaction to uh, high sun exposure. Right, but-, but it, is, it, it is a natural uh, consequence of those it, actions. Right, it's an, it's an illness. It's a, it's what, a What I would think would sickness, be more right? unnatural- You don't go out there to, to get melanoma. I'm sorry. Tanning to tanning just to look a certain uh, a different way. I, I feel like that is you know a less natural. No, I'm concept. I'm being somewhat I'm being somewhat flippant when I say that. But one human beings but are made to be people, in the sun. That is why people tan, similar to how no, people no, no, have no. sex. Pe- pe- people tan. Or, be, people tan because our skin has a natural reaction when we go out and work in the sun, as we have right. for the history but of humanity. People don't tan to get melanoma, and that's right. my point. Right. But right. so the so the purpose of our exposure to the sun is 
the production of vitamin D to uh, see a nice cheery landscape. That's, that's, that's what that is for, right? The, the, the car is for getting us from point A to point B, and there is a risk entailed, uh, which is that we might get into a car accident. Right. Sex is for something. Sex can result in pleasure, one hopes, but it is not for pleasure. It's, pleasure is a nice byproduct of it, but sex is for Babies. That's what that's what it comes down to. That's what that's what sex does. That's why we have it naturally. If you're if you're a big proponent of I don't know the latest evolutionary theories, that's what evolution would point at it for. If you recognize uh, the natural moral law, that's that's what sex is for. So it is for that, and uh, therefore you you, uh, you wouldn't call it a you wouldn't call it an un, unintended consequence or a sad uh, uh, consequence of some small risk. No, that's what sex is for. Cer- I, I think it can certainly be an unintended consequence when it is a, by definition, a consequence that is unintended. Well, when, the, when, uh, when people are, are abusing their uh, sexuality, yeah, certainly that's true. If you uh, Abusing if, their sexuality by having sex before marriage? Is that what no, you're talking well, about? No, by, by having sex uh, on, on the condition that if you become pregnant, you'll kill the baby through abortion. That would, that would certainly be an abuse of sex. Yeah, of course. Gotcha. Well, in your opinion. But again, I, no, ob- I, see, I see pregnancy as a consequence that is unintended if it's an unwanted pregnancy, because by definition, that is the consequence of your action that right. is unintended, similar but, to melanoma or uh, a car accident. But it, but it is. Yes, people people ab- abuse their sexuality all the time. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I pointed out the kind of tr- traditional, I know it seems kind of old timey now, but the traditional idea that you should reserve sex for marriage. Uh, but when you look now, at, for instance, at the Me Too movement, this would be a direct consequence of uh, promiscuity. When you look now, actually, at the spread of monkeypox, which is going around wait, the world right wait. now. Wait, Back up really quick. Yeah. <laughs> you think that the Me Too movement is a result of sexual promiscuity from of course, yeah. who? The rapists? Just so we're clear. No. Well, the Me Too movement includes much more than rape. But no, a cult, it, it is a culture in which casual sex is common and accepted and expected on the part of, in this case, degenerate uh, left-wing Hollywood executives from young starlets who wanted to make a big name for themselves. But, so th- that, that but the-, the Me Too movement only arises in a culture that, uh, that uh, begins to take sex in a way that is uh, frivolous and casual. Do you believe that it's possible for a husband to rape a wife? Yeah. Exactly. So I don't think that sexual promiscuity of our society or people's uh, having sex outside of marriage has anything to do with rape. No, I'm, t- I'm talking about the Me Too movement. I'm not talking about rape. With, you brought uh, up rape. I'm talking about the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement, which was several uh, women coming together to describe sexual harassment, sexual assault. Yeah. Uh, sexual you know, innuendo, uh, unwanted uh, people being punished in their careers because they wouldn't go sleep with a guy. That's a lot. That It includes much more than rape. It includes a, a, it, it describes a sexual environment that is not good for women because men have the expectation of promiscuous casual sex. And unfortunately, so our culture that- our culture supports that now. Do you think that it would be more liberating for women to, instead of, you know, simply holding these men accountable and teaching boys to be better and teaching women to be better too, because there are women who can sexually assault men 100% it happens. Um, instead of instead of focusing on that, you want what you want to make marriage or sex outside of marriage illegal? No, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't say I don't want to hold perpetrators and bad people accountable and have people take account right. of their. No, I, I, where would you get that from? Um, well, I'm just kind of confused because you're saying that, you know, the sexual promiscuity. We, are yes, we, we certainly should discourage promiscuous sex. We now have a monkeypox epidemic, the scientists seem to believe, because of orgies in Belgium. I don't know if that will ultimately be <laughs> considered to be the, uh, the uh, cause of it, but that's the, the floated theory right now. And uh, so, yes, yeah, sec- sexual uh, promiscuity and, uh, you know, uh, sexual selfishness is the cause of all sorts of problems, uh, health problems, uh, psychological problems, trauma problems, professional problems, all sorts of things. Of course, problems to children. And this, I guess this actually, believe it or not, brings us back to abortion, which is the the modern pro-abortion view is one in which sex is a selfish action that is only for the pleasure of the individual engaging in it. And, and, and frankly, in which... Like a USC frat bro, but I don't think everyone views sex as a selfish well, no, action. In, in this I way. I think that it can be a means to connect with another person. Sure, or, or selfish in that it's only for you and your partner, but certainly selfish in that if a baby arises from your union, that you uh, ha- have every right through your own exercise of your will to kill that mm-hmm. baby. 
That that is the selfishness that I'm talking about. The very no fact that you provide be, your resources to that right. fetus. Yeah, the ver- the very fact, and and to actively kill it though. When you take an abortion drug, you're poisoning the baby. When you go in and dismember the baby, yeah. you are killing the baby. So it's a little different than merely depriving the baby of resources. But that yes, that is. Uh, I think, an expression of selfishness, right? And, and so what I'm suggesting is an alternative. The very fact that you begin your argument from bodily autonomy to me seems to give away the whole game. Because isn't there something a little bigger than just the, the sheer exercise of my own will, however I want to do it in the physical world? Is it, is it not possible that I'm born into this world not merely with the rights and entitlements to do whatever the hell I please whenever I want to do it, but maybe some natural obligations to my family, to my community, to my country even? And, and right. if, I, if I have any natural obligations at all, mustn't I necessarily have a, a, an obligation to my own child? Well, so along with that, in terms of obligations to you have to that you would have to your community, would you support increasing your own income taxes so that uh, you can uh, pay for free housing, uh, universal health care? Well, I, I, I don't um, think that would help people. So I don't. I don't think one. You don't, I don't think, think, think that housing would help people. No, I, people. I don't think just giving people free housing willy nilly without any requirements. I don't think that would help people. I think that would actually harm them and harm their uh, work ethic and harm their uh, sense of self and dignity. Do you think so, it's easier to work when you're homeless or when you have a home? I, I think that uh, people are not primarily homeless. So, sometimes people fall through the cracks, but I don't think people are generally homeless primarily because they can't just, they just can't afford to pay rent. I think very often it's, especially now we have a labor shortage, but uh, very often it's because people are addicted to drugs. Very often it's because people are mentally ill. And uh, so, you, you know, giving someone a house in which to shoot up a bunch of drugs is not helping that person. It's harming that oh, person. So and I'm not convinced just, that raising taxes would do much either. So, but but if, so it, if it did, sure, you, I have nothing, no problem. Support, would you support you and, you know, other rich people in your community uh, paying more in taxes so that not only there would be these free housing centers, but they would also have, uh, you know, the uh, medical professionals and mental health professionals no. and drug but rehabilitation what, what, what the, what the government the person, What the government's been doing? Be no, no. I, listen, I'm not opposed to it in principle, but unfortunately, so many of these governments government-run drug programs are making the problem worse. They're giving what are called safe smoking kits to drug users. They're giving them needles. Look at what it's done to San Francisco. Now you've got bums and derelicts and human excrement and needles all over San Francisco. So the reason that I would oppose that is is not because I think that I have some intrinsic right to keep a little bit more of my money. The reason I oppose that is because it's disordered and doesn't work, and the people who it would empower to make these decisions are uh, morally idiotic. Unfortunately, I'm not talking about the free needle program. I'm talking about social housing. And if we want to specifically focus on reducing drug uh, drug addiction, you know, then we would go on to decriminalize all drugs like other countries have done and uh, seen. I don't, um, no, I don't think that follows results. Now, really, instead of throwing someone in jail for drug use, you send them to a rehab facility that is uh, publicly funded. Would you support that since you think no, you have an No, I don't think, community? again, I mean, we might quibble over our statistics, but I think it's pretty clear that when you criminalize drugs, you get less drug use. And this is what we saw from the 1970s to the 1990s. It's very funny because people say the war on drugs didn't work. It did. And illegal drug use dropped dramatically from the 1970s to the 1990s. And then we started to weaken those laws and drug use went back up. But that's only one aspect. We have a huge issue with uh, drug overdose, even if, uh, you know. Yeah, we should, we should have fewer less. drugs. I agree. And I think that we um, should. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah and I'm, like I'm for countries like drugs. Portugal that decriminalize drugs and uh, send people to rehab. And, no, and decrim- decriminalizing drugs will make the situation much worse, as it has in San Francisco, as it has in Portland, Oregon, as it has wherever it's been Is it easier to beat drug addiction when you're States. in rehab or jail? Is it easier to beat is it easier to beat drug addiction? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't too? mind. I don't mind putting criminals into prison uh, and having them also have some rehabilitation programs. But by the way, very, very few drug users go to prison for simple possession. The number is negligible. The reason that it sometimes shows up that way in government reports is because of plea deals from traffickers and drug dealers who plead down to simple possession. But the number is extraordinarily low. We're talking about single-digit percentages. The people who are in jail for drug crimes in the United States are in jail for for trafficking and for selling and for working in the drug industry. And I think they should rot. I don't think that they, especially at the, during the worst uh, opioid crisis in our country's history, I don't think that we should make it easier for them. Um, I wouldn't say decriminalizing drugs would make it easier to sell drugs. I think that if we wanted to see reduction in the rates of drug sales, uh, we're touching yeah, but, on but so many different topics today. We're Just touching stop on me a lot. Want to stop me. But um, well, it, I think that yeah. we need to focus more on making sure that uh, companies are providing livable wages and benefits to people so that they don't have to turn to something like uh, selling drugs. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to any of those things in principle. The way they work in practice, uh, you know, does, doesn't work very well. And sometimes people need a little bit of tough love. Uh, 
But to bring it all back, before I let you go, because we've run only an hour and 10 minutes over what you know, we had initially intended, but it's, it's lovely to talk to you. T- to bring it all back, you, you, seem, you seem like you want to do the right thing. You seem, you just said, you're a kind person, you want to be a kind person. And you've made all sorts of arguments about traffic lights and uh, you know, cars and bodily autonomy and all of these, all of these really abstract, hypothetical arguments as to uh, why, in theory, it's totally fine for a mother to kill her child and actually is required by all sense of goodness. But required. Requ- to have legal abortion, yeah, that it's required. You said it was, we, uh, we ought to have yeah, legal abortion. Yeah, to, to have legal abortion, not yeah. required to abort. No, no, you should hope not. The society wouldn't last very long if you were required to abort all your kids. So I, I guess then, because I suspect that you have this kind of uh, inkling toward wanting to do the right thing, I would just ask you, it, it, we've gotten rid of that sidebar that you had mentioned about, well, the baby isn't sentient in the womb. Well, the baby isn't self-aware in the womb. And okay, you know, fine. I mean, the babies can feel pain, by the way, in the womb, at least as late, at least at 20 weeks and probably as early as 12 weeks. So it's pretty, if, if feeling pain were the limit, you know, you would, you would get rid of a lot of abortions. But, but just even to think about the baby, and is it, is it not worth sacrificing some bodily autonomy? Is it not worth sacrificing some of our exercise of the will? Is it not worth sacrificing some of our casual sex that has really uh, exploded over the last 50 years and that you point out ha- leads to more abortions? Is it not worth sacrificing some of those things, some of our money, some of our body, even having a chronic illness after pregnancy, which doesn't happen a lot, but, but it can happen, let's say. Is it not worth sacrificing some of those things? to not kill the baby who you admit is human and alive, is even taking all the autonomy and all that stuff out, is it not worth it to not commit the action of killing that baby? I think that unless you are the one making that sacrifice, it is impossible to just... But let's say we've been so hypothetical all day. We've been talking about all these hypothetical things. So I'm, you're, saying, uh, so I'm asking you to use your reason. I'm not saying be in that position, or if you're not in that position, you can't have an opinion. I'm just saying, oh, yeah, we're not in that position right now. Yeah. But but we're using our reason. We're engaging in all this abstract thinking. So right. you do you do you not think it would be worth sacrificing those things to not kill your baby? Legally forcing people to sacrifice those things. Who am I to say that someone should be legally forced? You're to a have citizen in a self-government. You're a citizen in a self-government and you get a say over the laws. Who am I, who am I to say that we should legally force someone to have an increased risk of type two diabetes, of cardiovascular disease? Again, you're a citizen. Who who am I to say that people should be legally forced to make that risk? You you live in a, Victoria, you live in a self-government. You are a citizen and you have a say in what the laws are and how the country is run. And you get a say in all sorts of laws, whether we're talking about murder laws or parking ticket laws or education laws or laws that do put people at risk, laws about Mm -hmm. seatbelts, laws about traffic lights that you like so much. You, ha- you have a say in all of these things that will infringe on people's autonomy and might lead to tough outcomes for them. So I'm just asking you on this one as well, where it's, where it's so urgent, where you're talking about a little innocent little human baby that you admit is human and alive, would it not be worth sacrificing those things to not kill that baby? By, by the law, by the law. As you, because you're a citizen, you're going to vote on it, or at least vote for a representative. Oh, if I'm voting on it, on it I, I will vote to keep abortion legal. Again, I, I cannot. So you're saying it's someone. not worth it. It's well, not worth the sacrifice. Especially because everyone's personal sacrifice that they're going to have to make to continue a pregnancy to term is going to be different. I think it's impossible to create some blanket rule that will um, th- that should uh, take this right to decide away from people. It's not a right. That we're not. We're saying it's not a right. You're you're determining well, the laws right now. Okay, if I'm determining the laws, it's right. But um, that's too uh, bad. That's too bad. I, I thought. I mean, look, maybe, maybe we're so so far over. But look, you've you've made your you've made your argument, and it's if if not uh, if not totally consistent, it, there is at least a through line to it, which is bodily autonomy trumps everything, and uh, and it's an honest argument. I don't think it's true. I think it's ghastly. I think it's it's. Uh, to, to put one's own bodily autonomy above not killing a baby, I think is not only unreasonable, but, but it's, it's ghastly, it's wicked, it's evil. Uh, but, but that's your argument, you're sticking to it. I am. And regardless, I know obviously we'll never agree. Odds are I won't change uh, many minds on, on this video either. Uh, but I appreciate you for bringing me on and letting me share my perspective. I think 
hopefully that at the end of the day, even if pro-lifers and pro-choicers will always fundamentally agree in realms like bodily autonomy, hopefully one day we can all come together to focus on reducing like the things that cause abortion, for example, financial struggle. Hopefully we can all get on the same page about that one day. But until then, I am glad that we're having conversations like these. I am. And one, one thing we could change too are those laws. That's another cause of it. But I, I, Victoria, I really do appreciate your coming on. Uh, it's, uh, uh, people can find you, I believe, on TikTok at Victoria Hammett. Is that right? Yeah. H-A-M-M-E-T-T. Excellent. Victoria, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Awesome. Thanks. Bye.